Okay, right. Yes, chalk stream invertebrates then. My role with chalk stream invertebrates has really come about quite recently. Uh, I became involved sort of since the turn of the millennium, firstly with ARMI, uh, the scheme for um, volunteers to just monitor their rivers on a monthly basis as a pollution watch. And then working with uh, Matto in Pharma, um, we've actually uh, helped to develop the program which has turned into smart rivers where you have to identify right down to species level. Um, but it tells you so much more about uh, the stresses that are involved with your river. So currently Matt and I are doing quite a lot of work with that program. Um, before that, I've had a, a, a career in mainly in, in education. So we will go through um, the variety of invertebrate life that you like to find in rivers. Uh, so that means we're concentrating on animals without backbones. We will concentrate a little bit more on, on the insects because they've got a particularly strong role. Uh, habitat variation, where they're all living, how they manage to live there through their adaptations and uh, through their different feeding methods. And also, if we can, we'll get on to what the invertebrates can tell us about river health. Right, variety of invertebrates. Well, firstly, there are a lot of different invertebrates that are found in the river, lots of different groups. So if we go through those groups, uh, protozoa, obviously microscopic, to say the obvious, we don't see those very often, um, but you, you'd obviously need to get them out, put them under the microscope. Together with um, fungi and algae, okay, they're not strictly invertebrates, but it all gets a little bit fuzzy down at that end of, of, of life as to what's the plant and what's an animal. But those, those microscopic life forms have a very important role to play um, within um, decomposition and keeping a balance uh, amongst the, uh, the, the microscopic life. A lot of animals will actually be eating decaying vegetation, but what they're getting their nutrition from is that microflora and fauna that's living on those dead leaves. Where we can see these, um, these, these protozoa um, with a little bit of magnification, perhaps with a hand lens, is sometimes you see them as a little sort of fuzzy fringe on the outside of some of the other animals, particularly on the insects. They've got a hard exoskeleton, provides a good attachment for um, microscopic life, which is often there as a filter feeding. They're not using the animal for anything more than uh, attachment or somewhere to hang on to while they uh, filter the water and take out particles which are even smaller than they are. Some of them are bacteria, that sort of thing. Um, similarly, filtering the water, we've got sponges, the periphera. These are quite often overlooked. Some of them just wrap themselves around plant stems. Some of them, like this one, are attached to, attached to stones. And if you go in closer, you can see some large holes. And this is where water passes out of the, of the sponge, having gone in through the surface, which is a whole um, plethora of very tiny holes. So they take water in, wafting it in with, uh, with hairs through the body, which is made up of just an association of, of cells. Uh, some of those are grabbing sort of food particles and taking them out of the water and the water then exits through the big holes. We move on to the first of the worms, the first of the sort of organized life forms really. Um, platyhelminths, the flatworms, um, they are, as the name suggests, flat, and they just slide along on the on the bottom. They have a mouth which is about halfway along the underside. Um, the first part of the gut can come out, surround a, a food item, a, a small creature, um, which is usually pretty much dead when they find it. They they've got no, not really got much means of actually killing anything except sitting on it, and then they take that that item inside their bodies, uh, enzymes digest it, and anything that can't be digested has to go out the same way that it came in. There's only the one opening to the body. And there are no segments in, in the flatworms. Several species of those in our rivers. Uh, this one's Hydra, part of the Nidaria, formerly known as Silenterates, little ring of stinging tentacles. They're basically a jellyfish on a stalk, foods grabbed by the tentacles, um, stuffed into the mouth, digested 
and anything that can't be digested spat out again. The first group of animals which we're going to deal with with a hole at both ends, the oligochaetes, the true worms, um, annelid worms, segmented worms. They're, they're earthworm type animals. There are smaller worms which are not often seen. Uh, again, it's they're just overlooked really. But the, these um, oligochaete worms are, are big enough to be noticed. Some are as big as earthworms. Others are quite, uh, quite small and skinny. They've got an important role to play as part of the sort of decomposer network within, within the streams. Leeches are another branch of that same group of annelid worms and distinguished by having suckers at each end. Leeches are famously known for blood sucking, which of course this one does, this particular leech. This is found on, on fish and other vertebrates, uh, small ones sucking their, their blood. But there are also several which don't do that. They're actually, I refer to them as hunting leeches, and they just sort of quest their way around they find uh, anything that's sort of small enough that they can get their sucker, or their, their teeth into, which is in the front sucker, they'll sort of chew it up and ingest it. This one here is actually um, got its uh, its mouth inside the shell of a bivalve mollusk and is um, sort of scooping out the insides of that. Crustaceans, things that look a little bit like wood lice. There you've got to. Uh, the acellus, the water slater or hog louse, 14 legs, it's a detritus feeder. It feeds on dead leaves, shreds them, eats them, so important role. Uh, they're very tolerant of low oxygen conditions because they're often living you know, in amongst dead vegetation where there isn't a lot of oxygen. So if you've got loads of those in your in your stream, it means you've got lots of decaying vegetation, which probably means you're going to have um, reduced oxygen, and that's going to be a challenge for quite a lot of the other animals that are trying to live in a stream. More sort of active and uh, needing slightly better conditions are the freshwater shrimps. In a, in a chalk stream, it, you quite easily find sort of thousands of these within a standard sample that we take, which is just a three minute kick sweep sample. There should be thousands. Uh, sadly, in quite a few of our rivers, you know, the numbers are down to um, you know, low hundreds or even lower than that. They are an really important food for, for trout. So we need to find out in many cases why there are so few in some of our best chalk streams. Crayfish, and here we've got, uh, this is actually a signal crayfish, or quite a small young one. Most of the ones that we tend to come across with our sampling are signal crayfish, the invasive species, non-native. But uh, thanks to the efforts of some folk within the um, Wildlife Trust, we now have a few sites where the native crayfish is being re-established. And uh, that's, that's really good news. But we have to make sure that these chaps don't get up there and, um, and hamper that. Arachnids or spiders. Well, there is a, a water spider, but that's more of a pond animal. The arachnid that we find mostly uh, in our samples is the, is the mite, the freshwater mite, really tiny. They're a little bit like a, a pinhead with legs. Uh, so you, you've got to look carefully if you want to see them, but yeah, amazingly, you put them under a microscope and there's, there's an enormous variety of patterning, colors and patterning on them. Uh, some of the bigger ones are actually really bright red. And these are, these are predators hunting around for small creatures that um, they can stab and uh, then suck the insides out of. Mollusks, um, like this one, different species of water snail, those with spires and the ram's horn type, which are uh, flat shells. Freshwater limpets, tiny little uh, replicas of the uh, ones you see on the seashore, much more delicate, mind you. Also, then there's this uh, nerite, quite, quite a tight little spiral and a little shelf inside the inside the shell and it pulls itself back in but they're they're, they're quite pretty and attractive and a little bit of a, a river specialist uh, won't find that sort of uh, that animal outside of streams and they also there's bivalves i haven't put up any of the little sort of um bivalve mollusks here the little clams that we have too so that's quite a quite a big variety 
But what we haven't looked at are the insects. There's a, quite a large variety of insects as well within the, within the river. We start off with mayflies, because this is, is quite a, a primitive insect. Here you can see two different types, sort of the swimming type mayfly, a little darting swimming olives here, and a flat-bodied mayfly at the back there. These are herbivores. They spend um, their life as a nymph in the water for uh, usually a year. Some of them can complete a life cycle in, in less than a year. We've also got dragonflies, but not very many in the river, proper river situation. Um, this is a demoiselle. Uh, if you get some quite quiet stretches of the river, you will see some of the more familiar blue damselflies um, that uh, live in ponds generally. Um, but this, these demoiselles are the, are the specialists for living in, in rivers. There is also a, a dragonfly as well, um, particularly specialised in the rivers, which is a golden ring dragonfly. Stoneflies. Uh, here we, we're not very well endowed with stonefly species in the south of England, in, in the chalk streams. Uh, they, they really come into their own in the sort of north and west, uh, more bolder streams, the, the faster flowing waters. Um, we've got a few species, but they never get sort of really numerous uh, in, 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 within any of those species. True bugs. That one there is the lesser water boatman that's illustrated. They will only really survive themselves in, in the slower margins of the river. They, they're, not, they're not strong enough swimmers to cope with being, being out in the main stream. There are also there are, sorry, surface bugs like the, um, that water cricket. And again, they will scuttle around more often in the, in the slower moving parts of, parts of the river. Beetles, there are in fact a huge number of different species of beetle generally in the world. But within the, in the rivers too, there's there's quite a large number of very small um, beetles, um, which are quite a challenge to identify. Uh, but this one here, this little tiny one here, is is a riffle beetle. Um, they cope with living in the in the stream by uh, just hanging on tight to the substrate. They don't swim; they crawl. Whereas plenty of other beetles do swim very well. Whirligig beetles. For instance, extremely good at swimming both on the surface and underwater. And then you've got the standard diving beetles, which are predators and which sort of swim, swim down, swim actively around looking for their food. And these also have a very vicious predatory larval stage too. See, this one's actually grabbed hold of a little stickleback um, down there. So they're, they're, they're pretty voracious predators all around. True flies, that's flies with just the one pair of wings. Um, the hind pairs have been modified into little balancing organs called halters. So the true flies include um, the chironomids, which is there, the biting, the non-biting midges. That's a blood worm, which is a typical example of, of that. You've got black fly larvae, which stick themselves on by their back end while their front end is sort of held out in the current water goes by and a fringe of hairs around the head actually picks up small particles out of the water. Where the flow is, is less great, you might find in the margins uh, soldier fly larvae, like this one, which is where it almost permanently keeps its tail out of the water so that it can breathe air. Or you might find large crane fly larvae, and there are smaller species of crane fly, but this large crane fly is sort of typical of it. Soft body lives in in the sort of the muddy margins more often than not. Sort of there are the sort of soft squelchy areas around around the edge of the stream. Alder flies, a, a rather sort of niche group really. There's not many species of alder fly um, within their particular group. Uh, they're also predators. To my mind, they're they're quite timid predators. Whenever I've watched them. Um, they tend to, if they meet anything they're not sure of, they tend to go backwards first rather than go forwards into the attack. I've never actually seen one eat anything. It always seems to have been too scared to attack anything, but they, they obviously survive, so I don't know quite what they do eat. Caddisflies. People are often really fascinated by caddisflies because of the way they build a case around themselves using materials that are around. 
Uh, they're quite a challenging group to identify. I mean, there are 200 species in, in, the, in the country, maybe 15, 20 within a river fly sample that we've, we've taken. Um, but the characteristics for separating them are sometimes quite quite hard to get get a grip with. Different types of cases, as I said, this uh, this one's using a nice fine uh, fine sand grain case, and some don't have cases at all. This is a a, a roaming predatory caddisfly, just uses the hooks on its tail, uh, which is normally used to hold onto the case. They use it for hanging on, grasping the vegetation as they move around. A little more of a variation, this one builds a net and a bit like an underwater spider. It uh, catches things in the net, not necessarily live things, but any bits of material that are floating downstream that are edible, it will pick them off the net. And there is a small representation by moths, uh, China mark moth, for instance, and also uh, a, there is a parasitic wasp, which is the one in this, this picture here. A uh, little parasite which gets inside um, a caddis case, uh, parasitizes the larva. So all in all, an enormous variety of invertebrate life that you can come across within uh, the rivers that we have here, our chalk stream. Here we've got uh, an underwater view. It's a little bit of a turmoil going on here. We've got caddis fly, we've got a demoiselle, we've got a mayfly up on the rock up there. Uh, the freshwater shrimps bustling around. Just to, to tell you that this is uh, not underwater. These are in a very small vessel. One thing about these invertebrates is that they're not very noticeable. If there's a pollution incident and it kills off the invertebrates in the river, you won't notice. The river will just look the same as ever. Unless fish are killed, you don't really know that there's been a pollution incident. Where these uh, particular invertebrates have particularly come to mind is when they become adults and they come out into the air. So uh, mayfly, like this one, the mayfly, and other species of mayfly, they hatch and they should hatch in quite large numbers. And of course, fly fishermen make use of this. And it was really the fly fishermen that raised the first concerns about what was happening to our rivers because they weren't seeing the hatches of mayflies or caddis flies like this one over here. Caddis fly typically um, looks a little bit like a small hairy moth, always with the wings tented over the body. And then there's stone flies. So with these not emerging into the air, you know, there was, there was no indication that there was anything wrong. Um, insect life cycles, two patterns of the life cycle. Uh, there's complete metamorphosis, as it's called, which most people are familiar with, which is the butterfly life cycle. Caterpillars hatch from those as the larval stage. As they grow, their skin can't grow with them because it's a hard exoskeleton made of chitin, so they have to shed the skin, get a new skin, which is initially soft, pump it up, grow some more molt, and so on. They go through several stages as larvae before they pupate. We go into a chrysalis stage during which the body's reorganized. It's already undergone some reorganization before that, that final larval molt, as you can see, because the, the chrysalis comes out with, with sort of wing shapes on the outside. But then we get to the uh, adult stage, which is quite a lovely creature, but it's very different from its larval stage. So this is complete metamorphosis. From the egg hatches a larva which doesn't resemble the adult particularly and the adult then emerges from the pupa having gone through that reorganization stage. Uh, it's also true for the, uh, the true flies, they also follow this particular pattern of complete metamorphosis. This is a non-biting midge life cycle. Eggs are laid in a jelly mass, the little uh, larvae first hatch out within that jelly mass of slightly protected by it but initially. Uh, several molts they go through before they form a pupa and then that becomes the adult, the eggs are laid again. <clears throat> they can go through several generations in one year. Just as a curiosity, fly fishermen actually do imitate one particular fly pupa. This one, they call this, this fly um, or this pattern a grey boy midge 
and it does actually look remarkably like the the species of, of midge that is actually supposed to represent. Um, also with this pattern of life cycle are the beetles, the order flies and the caddis flies. So they all have larvae. Metamorphosis, which involves uh, not actually going into a pupal stage. That's the big difference. What hatches from the eggs, as in the mayflies, is an animal which is called a nymph, and it looks pretty much like it's going to look as an adult, with the exception that its wings are just little buds on the back, and they grow bigger every time the animal molts. So in this case, there's quite large wing buds there. So this is probably a mayfly uh, nymph in its last stage as a nymph, and the next time it molts, it will be as an adult. And they do that, they just come up to the surface, touch the surface with the top of their um, thorax, top of their body, and pull themselves out through a slit that opens up there and onto the surface of the water. And then they don't hang about there because they're very vulnerable. So they would normally quickly fly off uh, into the bankside vegetation or the bushes. And then mayflies do something quite extraordinary. They do another molt. They're the only insects to do this. And these pictures are courtesy of um, Cyril Bennett, who's the great riverfly champion. Um, what happens then is that the skin splits again at the same point, and the animal pulls itself out from within that first adult skin, actually the sort of sub-adult skin, and what comes out from there is a sort of a bright, shiny, fully mature adult. And that's called the spinner. The first stage was called the dun. And so you've now got this nice shiny animal. And of course, typically with mayflies, the next stage is to hurry up, find a mate. If it's female, lay eggs, because 24 hours is quite often all you've got for that part of your life cycle. Uh, so maybe a year, in some cases, two years growing up in the water. And then 24 hours, 48 hours, and it's all over as an adult. So besides the mayflies, we've also got stoneflies, uh, dragonflies, and the true bugs. And these are their examples of their nymphs. And with this lesser water boatman here, I think you can really, really easily see, if I bring in the adult from the side, how little changes from a nymph to the adult. The wing buds are here, and the adult has just now got fully expanded wings covering the body and it's got a, a rather nice pattern over it. Okay, so a nymph, you can see the segments down there, the adult, you're seeing the wings over the back. Now with all this variety of animals in the, in the river, it's no good if, if the river was just one uniform habitat, um, there, there wouldn't be the availability uh, opportunity for all this variety to exist. You have to have subdivisions within that habitat. Some people call them microhabitats. Some say the mesohabitats. What's the difference? What, what, how do we break that stream down into these into these sort of subhabitats? They vary according to these parameters down the side here, this list down here. And if you look at a stretch of chalk stream, this happens to be the River Meehan at, at Droxford, you can see that there will be variations in flow when the water comes under that little bridge there. It's been channeled, uh, held up a little bit. It'll rush out from under the bridge. So there'll be a faster flow up there. It'll be pushed fast around the outsides of that, that little island down there and then come back together um, where it'll slow down again. Um, depth often goes with that. You know, rivers tend to be flow faster over shallow areas and slower over deeper areas. Um, what also is, is linked to this, they're all interlinked to a large extent, is the, is the bed material. So in the slower flowing areas, you'll tend to find um, a more of a, sandy silty deposit on the bottom and as you move out into the faster areas you'll get gravels and hopefully nice clean gravels because that's what we like to see in, in chalk springs we like to see these nice clean gravel beds where so many of the animals like to live and where obviously the trout and the salmon are going to want to spawn as well you've got submerged plants you can see these dark green areas of, of ranunculus um, the water buttercup um, within there that's going to provide uh, attachment areas for animals, but it's worth saying that the, the actual plants themselves are not directly the food 
for most of the animals. They're going to be eating algae that's growing on the plants or algae that's growing on the gravels um, and, or else they're eating detritus, dead leaves and things like that. So the plants themselves are not normally eaten by the invertebrates in the river. Problem is they're more often eaten by swans and that's that's another issue, which I'm, <laughs> it's a rabbit hole I'm not gonna go down. Around the edges there's emergent vegetation and wherever there's vegetation, it tends to reduce the flow. So you'll find that uh, the animals which like lower flow will be perhaps in these margins or in, in the middle of this weed. So you've got lots of different potential mesohabitats here in this stretch of river where you can accommodate this great variety of, of animal life. Just to sort of um, underline this, this, uh, this diagram, the statistics of which I don't pretend to understand, but what it was, it was a study of the sea by Wessex Water. These are the species living in different mesohabitats. So some of them are written out silt, marginal vegetation, submerged vegetation, sand. There's also SPG stands for silty pebble gravel as opposed to pebble gravel. What you can see is that the, the, the species, you know, separate themselves out according to those, those different mesohabitats. Although those that can live in, like living in um, sand, can also quite happily live in um, silty pebble gravel, and, or maybe into, into pebble gravel. A few of them will cope with silt. Um, but the marginals, there's, there's not a lot from the marginals which will live, live anywhere else. So you've got this separation um, by place within the within the river. But what they also have to allow for the variation is adaptations. They meet the challenges of living in flowing water. So if you want to breathe underwater, you're going to have to have some modifications which allow you to make the most of, of the of the oxygen that's at your disposal there. And there are both air breathers and gill, gill bearers within these animals that we've looked at already. So the air breathers are ones which will tend to, will have to go up to the surface to collect a fresh supply of air. And there are the ones with gills, which are going to be just leaving sort of thin areas of their, their cuticle exposed to the water so that so the oxygen and, can transfer in and carbon dioxide out. Um, but if you've got those areas, they're, they're a vulnerability. And there are those which sort of kind of span the two, which we'll have a look at as we go on through the sort of video clips in a minute. Maintaining position is a, is a key thing because if you let yourself go in a stream, the next stop is the sea. Well, you definitely want to be, don't want to be there. So you've either got to swim hard and invertebrates are not generally strong swimmers. Fish can manage this, obviously. You know they can they can swim and hold hold their position. Uses a lot of energy to do it, but you're better off grabbing hold of something. Uh, the animals do sometimes uh, or are grabbing hold do let go from time to time. There's something called drift, which normally happens more at night, where animals have let go and they've drifted down the stream and then settled again in another area, and then they start walking back up again. And this is probably a way of actually distributing themselves um, because they may well be in a, a, a wrong area or they've depleted the resources in that area. Generally, they they're spend most of their time trying to avoid being washed downstream. Feeding, what we all do when we're feeding is just transferring the sun's energy from into our body, having to, you know, obtained it from another creature that's actually obtained it from a plant. Lots of different feeding methods, but I said earlier, most of the actual input from the sun is channeled through the algae and the dead leaves. And the other thing we've mentioned is avoiding predation. So you can do this by, by camouflage, perhaps hiding yourself, burying yourself, being quicker than what it is that wants to eat you. <clears throat> but you've got to actually, if you're going to be successful, you've got to avoid becoming somebody's lunch. So right, let's have a look at some uh, some of these animals in action again. This is um, this is a video about the uh, life in the River Mian. This is this is chalk stream is one which has often been described as a Cinderella of uh, chalk streams because it's uh, the one that's been least modified in the way that the tests and itching have been. 
and it was picked out as a typical Lowland River by Nigel Holmes in his book on rivers. All of the video you're about to see has actually been recorded <clears throat> on this vehicle, the High Tech Wild Trek trailer, which I um, towed around for about nearly 20 years. So what we then were, were looking at, and it was things like the freshwater shrimp, the ubiquitous freshwater shrimp. Typically, well, here we've got actual pairs of them, the big male holding onto the female. And here it's the blue-winged olive, a type of mayfly. And what you're seeing there is its gills on its back. It's actually uh, flailing its gills around like that in order to get a good air water supply over the top, um, by which it can then extract the oxygen from, from there. They don't like swimming much. They much rather hang on. They're in, usually in faster flow. But this is an olive type of mayfly again. But these ones are, are reasonably good swimmers over short distances, as opposed to the flat-bodied mayflies, which uh, need to cling on because they're going to be found in more faster-moving waters where they want to hang on to the gravels, the bigger gravels and um, um, pebbles. They're using gills along the side of their body there um, to extract the oxygen from the water. But where they've got plenty of flow, they're usually going to be better off for the oxygen because of fast flowing water picks up more oxygen from the air. Case caddis, we refer to um, the, the case is a means of avoiding predation because they can easily be overlooked and uh, not only just visually, but if I think if a fish picked one up, having thought it saw something move, all it would taste would be sand and it may well spit it out again rather, rather than swallow it. So it's a good way of avoiding avoiding um, being eaten. Here you've got one which has used bits of decaying wood. Um, its actual common name is the caperer, but it doesn't seem to be doing much capering with this case on the back. So I think that probably refers to its, uh, its adult counterpart. And then there's a small version, smaller species there, which is um, the uh, a long-legged caddis, a uh, particular particular family of caddis, and that one's made a very fine sand grain case. Not all of them make cases. We said this one, Hydropsyche, is one which has gills on the underside, very easy to see. It has two hooks on the back end, which it's using to hang on because it again is a net builder. So it will be trying to find out which way the current's flowing, which wasn't anyway in this particular jar. And then you've got the hunting type. Again, you can see its gills, but it's using the hooks there as part of its uh, acrobatic trick, climbing up that plant stem, um, where it's, it's actually hunting for other invertebrates that it can eat. We say caddis flies have a complete metamorphosis. So this is the pupa stage that would actually would normally have been covered over with these, these stones. The caddis would have created a shelter. It was in a caseless variety. This one creates a shelter with small stones and pupates inside that. Black fly larva you mentioned, stuck on by its back end onto a, onto a stone and the front end is Again, trying to pick particles out of the current of water, which is should be flowing past it. And the other animal there is a riffle beetle larva, the larval stage of the of the riffle beetle. The little tuft at the end there, little tuft of hairs which comes out, which allows it to extract oxygen from the water. Whereas the adult riffle beetle here has got a little air bubble on the end. And like a lot of beetles, it uses that as a kind of artificial uh, gill because the surface area of that bubble can take oxygen out of the water. They move very slowly and they don't want to let go because uh, they get washed away. So they've got really good, good um, hooks on the end of their legs and they crawl about looking for um, their food, which is... Uh, largely algae, I think, in their case. 
They have air on the undersides of their bodies. They have one pair of legs for swimming with, one pair of legs for standing on, and the other pair of legs for eating. And they they are usually picking up material off the off the off the bed of the stream. Uh, flatworm, they're going along very slowly. Again, it just slides along. Uh, it can it, it can exchange oxygen over the whole surface of its body because it's got no no thick outer cuticle or of any sort. As with the worms, they're sort of thin enough skin to be able to take oxygen in. Leeches, this is one of the hunting leeches. The other leech over there is a snail leech. Um, this one, as the name suggests, will actually eat snails. Quite often you, you can find one with its, its nose buried into, uh, into a snail shell. Whereas the fish leech, when it's cresting around, it's trying to stick its, its front end sucker onto a fish. Demoiselle nymphs, these are more like ambush predators. Uh, they have caudal lamellis, tails at the end there, which um, can extract uh, uh, oxygen from the water. Whereas this golden ring dragonfly nymph trying to hunker down into, uh, into the bed of the river is, is an ambush predator. There hides away from the base of the base of the river. And it breathes by pumping water in and out of its rectum. And there, it's actually got gills inside there. But what they do have is rather formidable jaws at the front end, really jagged, sort of looks like man trap type uh, um, jaws at the front end there. Uh, a vertebrate's just snuck into this. Free spine sticklebacks are very important predators of a lot of the small invertebrates. They tend to be in the uh, slower moving reaches uh, around about the uh, marginal vegetation, whereas the bullhead just sneaking into the corner of this picture over here will be found in the faster moving streams. And there was a beetle just went up to the surface. And also just tucked in on the end of this video is the brook lamprey. Specialist of our small streams, the, the larvae are filter feeders burying themselves in the sandy silt. When they when they turn into adults, the adults have only got a short life and they don't feed at all. They're just they're just there to mate. And these, unlike their their cousins, their larger cousins, these don't go to sea at all. They spend all their life um, in our streams. Food webs then. So this is this is really important because these animals have to avoid um, competition with each other over food. And so you do get a very complex food web with such a such a variety of, of life in, in the river. Um, <clears throat> this diagram I've actually actually borrowed from a book called The Trout, rather heavy on the on the, the top end of the predators up here. Sort of passes over the complexity of, of insect larvae and other invertebrates in, in this little section here. But it does show the importance, you know, general trends of food energy movement from the aquatic vegetation eaten by, by various things. The algae is really importantly eaten by a lot of those uh, things as well. And, you know, the fungi that, and bacteria which are doing the decomposing become part of that food material. And then the small fish tend to pick off most of the insect larvae, the freshwater shrimps, and the larger invertebrates, and in turn being uh, eaten by a, a pike maybe or an otter. Fortunately, a lot of our chalk streams now are working on if you catch wild brown trout, you, you put them back rather than you, you take them away so that we can maintain their populations. And then there's a, a fully terrestrial um, heron. If we were doing this as a sort of a, an in-person chat tonight, I'd probably perhaps give you the opportunity to build your own food web. Um, I made up some cards like these, which have the sources of food coming in via the sun at the, on these type of cards. These are some of the primary consumers, the ones that are actually making use directly of that, uh, that plant-based food. And then you've got uh, a consumer, something that's going to eat those. And finally, the heron up there is the top predator. 
what you can what you can actually do with these cards is you can actually you know try and work out yourself what represents a decent food web in uh, in the chalk stream particularly if it's one you've got for yourself your own chalk stream you could um, use use cards like this and then you've got the heron feeding on a trout par which has eaten maybe a blue winged olive that's been feeding on some algae or it might be a willow fly which has been eating those dead leaves laced with fungi and bacteria so that's one route of energy going into the heron you've got another four opportunities there to, to feed it on other things with other food and bearing in mind that the, the more complex of the structure of a food web is the more likely it's going to be a stable ecosystem you know if a trout par has only got sort of a very limited amount of, of different choices of insects to eat and one of those suffers some catastrophic you know sort of failure of its population then the trout par may not survive and therefore the heron will have to go and look somewhere else for its food and it won't be in the river. Managed to find out a lot about the invertebrates. We don't know all about them, but one thing we can do is we can we can sample them and help them to tell us what's wrong with the river. And we do this with a stick sweep sample plus the one minute hand search. The same method is used throughout water research and monitoring but you have to collect from all those meso habitats in proportion to their coverage. So you've got to collect from the gravels, you've got to collect from the weed, the margins. When we're doing it, Matt and I, that's Matt, we also take photographs of the substrate and everything because it's something you can you can refer back to on, on subsequent visits. What you do with those invertebrates, sadly, if you want to identify them beyond family level, you have to kill them. Uh, instantly and then identify them using a microscope you can just work to family level um, but if you do that you're losing a lot of the definition of the sampling because some families will only have one species in them whereas others may have 30 or more as it says there with varying degrees of tolerance so if you uh, picked out a family of caddis flies like the um, limnophilidae then there's a very large number of uh, species within that. And, uh, you know, some of them are quite happy or mostly often live in, live in ponds, whereas others of them do like living in, in streams and fast flowing water. So they've, they've got really different tolerances. But what does all this tell us? Well, what we do is we, if we've done this to usually beyond species level, it's usually something called a mixed taxon level, we can calculate metrics. Um, so values which help us to describe what's going on within, within that stream. Uh, initially, BMW p-values were scored, that's the Biological Monitoring working, working Party, based just on family levels, um, but it didn't take into account of abundance at all. So that has actually been replaced, but it's, it's still quite a useful one to sort of think about in terms of what's good quality. And if you've taken that sample, from that you can um, get a full species list from what's in your river. I know you probably won't be able to read that one, but bear in mind, you can see the variety of different uh, creatures down here. This top panel up there is, is about calculating the metrics. Because by calculating those, you can see something about, it'll tell you something about all of these uh, factors or stresses that might be impacting your river. And knowing that there is a problem, it means you can know where to look as to how to possibly fix it. And there's a sort of lookup table which you can go to to see what's good and what's bad for those various uh, various metrics. And you can plot, plot the graphs out. And this is a sort of a year-by-year year plot for autumn samples for Yavington on the Itchin. Um, where the black bars end up in any sort of red sectors, then it indicates that there's something um, not quite, certainly not right. If it's in an amber sort of section, then still you, you need to be looking at things. But you can see amazing variation going on here, year on year. 2019 was a good year. Um, and if you, you know, you can actually look back and find out what are the factors that contributed to that. But that, that lookup table I showed you was just a generalist, generalist one, really. It sort of applies to everywhere. So BMWP greater than 70 is considered as a good score. But that's good for a pond as well as for a river. But in a chalk stream, if you get less than 100, you're actually disappointed. 
you know, there are lots of different rivers. This is a, a you know a river coming down off Dartmoor. It's um it's quite acidic. It's got very few nutrients. The riverbed is mainly sort of boulders. Um, so fewer opportunities for animals to live in there. This is uh, part of the river Rother, which just sort of crawls along in the summer. Uh, not much better than an elongated pond at times in, in some sections of it. And then you've got chalk stream, one of the most diverse aquatic environments that there is. So just having a sort of one size fits all obviously doesn't work. There was um, a, uh, a scheme, as I said, set in 1977, which attempted to go and look at unpolluted, unstressed rivers and find out what their state was and put values, you know, put these values in place for unpolluted streams, RIV packs and RICT, which was the sort of computer tool which you could go on to to actually get a prediction for any particular river that you wanted to sample. Sadly, there weren't any unpolluted chalk streams around in 1977. So, you know, we've ended up with a sort of a baseline, which is not really uh, as, as good as it should be. So what does, you know, accurately reflect the pristine chalk stream? Uh, I'll just show you another little quick burst of video. In this case, we're looking at one of those uh, crane fly larvae, which has got both uh, openings called spiracles. The black things that look like eyes are actually spiracles opening into it. Well, they're closed at the moment because it doesn't want water in it, but opens into the trachea system, plus little finger-like gills around the outside. We've got the blue-winged olive there. Here's a large mayfly. This is the mayfly. Now, this wants to burrow because it's a detritus feeder. But it keeps its gills up high on the back so that when it's actually in the in the mud and silt, it's got those gills right up near the surface. The animal in the centre foreground is a caddis with ballast stones on the side. Um, there's a beetle coming in there with its air bubble for breathing. Over here, this snail here has got a little opening here, it opens and closes. That's leading into a chamber where it's got a little gill in there. And like all snails, it's protecting itself by having a hard shell on the outside, which makes it difficult for uh, other animals to eat it. Um, this is a uh, shell called Bithynia. And there's a better view of uh, <clears throat> that caddis. This is the beetle going up to the surface. Not the same one, but similar, where it's actually replenishing the air, which it, it holds under its wing cases on the back or in fine hairs on the side. And here we're seeing the lesser water boatman with a complete sort of shimmering bubble of, of air held on hairs on the underside of the body. And what they tend to do, they seem to sort of massage this. So I think this is one way they can actually try and actually stay down longer by using that that um, air surface, air water interface. This bug, this is another true bug, the saucer bug, and this one has got thin areas on the underside of it so that it actually has gills that it can, so it can stay underwater and doesn't have to go up to the surface. This little cat is scampering in from the side. If you watch that carefully, you can see this waggling up and down going on, and that's because it's actually moving water through the case and over the gills that are along the side of its body. Another case caddis, and we've got the demoiselles. Demoiselles, judging by the, the, the markings on the tail, it's probably a banded demoiselle. Then we move on to some leeches. This is the snail leech. Uses its suckers to get around, so it's always holding on with one sucker. The other hunting leech, which I think we might be going to see in a minute, does actually let go and swims a bit by undulations of the body, but this one holds on. The dark markings are the um, gut inside, little branches of the gut. So the gut runs through, but it has side pockets. Here we've got those that pair of mayflies, the ones that like living in fast water and are really flat, holding on tight, letting the water go over the top of them. 
and the mayfly here, the spot sort of short first swimming ones, darting mayfly, are the olives. This blue winged olive here is feeding, eating away at um, the algal covering on that stone. You can see how green that stone is, an absolute banquet there for it. The more sort of flat bodied type, again, scraping algae, which is less obvious. But there's obviously something there because they're quite happily sort of scraping away with their mouth parts over the surface of that stone. And here comes a blue winged olive coming to join in as well. Here we're going to watch a, a freshwater shrimp working on a piece of dead vegetation. There it is, it's picked it up and it's chewing away. Here's the hunting leech and using its suckers to move around. It's, there's a worm here which is a bit big for it to tackle. That when a smaller worm, it would certainly have, uh, have attempted to eat that. Here we've actually got a snail leech eating a snail. And if you watch this area here very carefully, you will see in a minute something that's sucked out from inside that snail. And here's a, here's a leech questing. It's looking for somewhere it's going to actually chew its way into that uh, skin of that bullhead. A little beetle larva on the prowl. They've got uh, good jaws on them and they bite into something. They can then pump digestive juices in and dissolve them. Freshwater shrimps, normally in, in with the currents flowing strongly, they will do what this one's doing, which is get down in amongst the stones. They don't want to be on the surface where they're vulnerable to predation, vulnerable to getting washed off most of their food being dead leaves and things like that is also sort of down in amongst the gravel. So that's where that's where they're going to spend most of their time. Here's a worm, which again is very vulnerable when it's out on the surface. So this one's obviously been picked out from the river and it's been dropped into this tank. So it's now doing its best to find somewhere to get under cover. Snails, this one, this type is an, actually an air breathing snail. So it's gonna at some point have to get up to the surface to replenish the oxygen, the air that it's sort of holding within a, in a space underneath the shell, a special cavity within that uh, body under the, under the shell. And just like to finish up with this one, and I apologise for anybody who hasn't eaten yet, it's going to want to eat later, but this is a, a demoiselle feeding on a caddis, which uh, was out of its case. So it's a really good reason to stay in your case, because if you come out of your case, you like to be picked up by a demoiselle and shredded. So quite a messy eater, that one.